Hey guys, Captain JJB84 here. Um, here at the movie review of uh, 2010, the year we made contact. Um, I didn't watch this in a theater. I just watched this on YouTube for all those who, I guess, friends of me on YouTube and uh, see the recent information I comment on that video. Yeah. Um, but anyways, we're here. I'm here to talk about it. And, uh, um, okay, first off, I really like this. Um, I, <clears throat> I thought 2001, you know, I gave a mixed positive review, but I still thought it was alright. I mean, I see why people liked it. Uh, this one, however, I really liked, um, I'm still going to do my notebook here, my notes, uh, oh god, where are they? Okay, here we are. So, yeah, um, this takes place, like, um, you know, uh, after, um, 2001, it, um, yeah, after 2001, so, we see, uh, Dr. Floyd, uh, from the first movie, and, um, he's played by Roy, Schne Roy Scheider, who's sadly no longer with us, and, um, and, uh, he's being, um, he's just sitting there working on a saddle, work on this big satellite thing. And, um, comes a Russian guy who says, I need your help. And, um, what I do like about this one is, uh, the Cold War feeling. There's the, the essence of the Cold War. Th that plays a big, major role in this movie. And, um, it's added in very nicely. So, this Russian guy says they need help. And they say, like, if we can get to the Discovery, then uh, we can reactivate HAL and see the monolith again. So, but... Tensions are really building between the Russians and the Americans. Sorry, the Soviets. <laughs> and, uh... Um, so... Yeah, and, um, they need to convince, uh... The Americans need to convince the Russians that they need to go with them. Because, uh, the Americans have the information about the discovery and how. And, um, but... They think, like, this won't make for good news. But, yeah. Then we're introduced to Dr. Shander, who built, who, uh, I think he built Hal or something? I don't know. But, operating with, uh, Sal, who's essentially like Hal, a female version, I guess. Yeah, yeah, put in genders. <laughs> um, and, uh, he wants to reactivate Hal just as much as, I guess, the Russians do. I then get one other guy, uh, I don't know, he's doesn't really have a huge role. And then, um, yeah. One thing to note is that there's a lot of great acting from uh, Roy Scheider. Roy Schneider, Scheider, Rob Scheider, I don't know. Roy Scheider, I think. Um, and uh, he, he puts in a good performance. Um, so does Dr. Chandra. I don't know who he played by. And uh, so do um, the Russian. Oh, uh, Helen Mirren. Yeah, she's the main Russian cosmonaut. Female cosmonaut. And then, um, so... And then, uh, it takes a while to get into space, so to get to Jupiter. So they get into Jupiter, and, uh, one thing I do like is that, unlike 2001, which showed, like, um, like, five minute long scenes of a ship moving from point A to point B, this one just sort of skips over it. It's effective, but, you know, I wouldn't mind just seeing the ship take off, maybe, and seeing the Americans being put into, you know, uh, hibernation mode. And then they're brought to wake, and then, uh, the Russians give them a status report, and, um, you can already see the tensions between them. The Russians don't really know a lot, but this guy's just kind of worried because they picked up some sort of uh, thing. They found chlorophyll on Europa, and um, I think that plays a role in the later books of the series. Europa has some sort of important role, and um, yeah. Um, and so they venture around Jupiter and eventually find the discovery covered in a sulfur dust, it's like all orange, and just sort of swinging around in motion. Um, 
the one American guy, I can't remember his name, and um, Max, the Rus Max, the Russian guy, venture forth to get it. What is annoying is that the American guy, he keeps this heavy breathing, like, <laughs> you know, throughout the entire scene, I'm just like, oh god, shut up. So, they get to the Discovery, they get in there, and, uh, well, there's actually some nice character development. Um, the American guy has a bit of a fear of heights. So, um, so, uh, the Russian guy, um, teaches him a bit of Russian. And they get over there, and then, um, they think, like, oh god, is Bowman here? Because they think maybe he died, because they smell a bit of raw meat or something. And they realize, oh wait, he left, so he can't be here. It must have been some meat that went raw. Um, they reactivate the, um, the Discovery, starting her engines up. And then, uh, Dr. Chandra goes aboard and, uh, reactivates Hal. We're then introduced, we're then given something that a confused Matthew thought was... Not the very effective. Um, Hal is probably the strongest point of 2001. But here, it's kind of the weakest part. I mean, they introduce um, why Hal malfunctioned. As well as uh, a few other things. Realizing that it was uh, the Roy, Schne Roy Scheider, that's just the actor's name, his fault that Hal went haywire. But yeah. Um... Uh, there's a few cameos in this movie by Arthur C. Clarke and, uh, Stanley Kubrick. And Helen Mirren plays the Russian cosmonaut woman. Um, and just to clarify this up, I saw a bunch of comments of this. Helen Mirren's of English and Russian descent. So, she speaks with a fairly good Russian accent. This is ironic, I think, because she plays the queen in The Queen. <laughs> uh, anyways... Um, so, but then things get worse. Um, uh, we learned that, uh, the U.S. was building a bit of a blockade of ships around, uh, you know, uh, Central America, and a Russian ship decided to, to test the wall, to test the blockade, and attacked it, but the America, the American ships fought back and destroyed the Russian ship and killed 800 people, 800 Russians. So... They say, fuck it, we're going to war. And so this causes problems, because uh, the Discovery is U.S. property, while the Russian ship, the... Um, what's it called again? Crap, crap, crap. Uh, the Leonov, the Leonov, is Russian territory, so they now have to be separated. But, but um, they can't leave Jupiter just yet, because they don't have enough fuel... To get into position. And I should admit, before they get to the Discovery, there's this one scene, it's one of the best scenes in the movie, where um, they have to get to uh, Io to where uh, the Discovery is, and they do this thing called arrow breaking. In, um, you may see it in some shows, and maybe in other shows, where it's pretty much where they use the, they go into the outer atmosphere of a planet and go through the outer atmosphere collecting enough speed to get all the way through and then we'll eventually sort of pull them away from the gravity of the planet and the thing is this is supposed to work on paper no one's actually managed to test this out so the Russians test it out they try it Helen Mirren's character that's with Roy, Sch Roy Scheider in a little uh, skate pod I think it's a skate pod and um, it works and, uh, it's just a really good scene. Uh, I should check it out. Um, so, it goes without a hitch, and they're all right, and they get to the Discovery. So, anyways, the two, they declare war, and now they're separated. So, one day, or Roy, um, one part, the next after that, Roy's, Roy Shire's just sitting down, and, uh, Hal says, oh, there's a message. From who? I don't know. What's it say? It says you got to leave in the next two days. Why? And then, out of nowhere... Dave Bowman shows up. Uh, and I was like, holy shit. <laughs> and played by the same actor. Um, and then Roy talks to Bowman, and uh, you see Bowman sort of turn into his older forms, his younger forms, and even, the em and even the embryo, or the fetus or whatever. So, 
Yeah. Um, so he talks to him, says you have to leave the next two days, and then we see, and then um, Roy Scheider does a very dangerous thing. He gets a bond the Levinov, talks to Helen Mirren's character, and then they realize the monolith. It's gone. That was another key scene. Max at one point tries to goes into a little pod and tries to get on top of the monolith. And the monolith is huge, it's like two kilometers in length. And in doing so, some energy came out of the monolith and shot and killed him. And uh we learn of what happened to Dave Bowman. Apparently he became some sort of super being or something. And um he travels back to Earth and uh goes to his wife to say let's say like I'll never see you again. Goodbye. Then the next thing, he goes to his mother, who was sitting in a who must have had a heart attack or something. She's in a hospital, and then he starts combing her hair, invisibly. I think, or he possessed the comb. I don't know. So Bowman's like a super being, <laughs> super saiyan. <laughs> um. So yeah. Then. Then the monolith disappears, and then uh, they realize. There's a big old hole inside of Jupiter. Jupiter's now being eaten away. So they they realize that the Discovery has enough fuel to make a launch, and the Levinoff has enough fuel to make it back to Earth. So, doing careful time, and they have to angle their position just right so they can get away from Jupiter. Um, and then, uh, but Dr. Chandra's worried because what if Hal doesn't, because... Because they got the launch, but they had to let go of the discovery. In doing so, Hal will be destroyed. So, if, um, but what what Schneider didn't tell Ro what Ted didn't tell Doctor Schneider is that he put a kill switch near Hal's circuits, so it'll you know inside a calculator, and so he pushed the button on the calculator, and Hal will be destroyed. Though Doctor Schneider did find it. Um. And uh, after that. Well, they work together, and they realize the hole in Jupiter is becoming bigger and bigger. And we learn it's compo it's being composed, the hole's being created by just thousands and thousands of these giant monoliths. Like the two-kilometer size monoliths. One by four by nine. So, yeah. They're screwed. So, Dr. Shandra gets on, is the only one left on Discovery. Tells how, slowly tells how, how, that, that... You could be that uh, you're probably gonna yeah you're gonna get destroyed. But Hal says it's all right, and so Doctor Chandra gets out. They get away, but and then they leave the discovery. But just before the discovery is destroyed, like a minute, um, Bowman talks to Hal and says, "Send this message. It'll be the last message you ever send and the most important one." And it says, and "It says leave all the pl all these moons are y are yours except for Europa." Give no landing here. And I think that play is in the books, like uh, 2071, I think. 3001. Um, so, yeah. And then a new sun is created. So, now it becomes Tatooine. Now they have two suns. So, yeah. And uh, they get back, and we see a bit of a cliffhanger. We see a monolith on Earth. Oh god, it's Titan A all over again. So, yeah, that's the movie. Um, very good. Um, you know, that's just sort of my version of the summed up version. But I think it's very good, very underrated. I mean, you can you can argue saying, okay, it doesn't have the same mystery or the same ness of the first film, but this is a this is an entirely different film altogether by two by, you know, Peter Hyams. Um, he, he doesn't really direct too many good films, but this is probably his best film. So, I'm going to give this an honest 8 out of 10. That's .5 higher than what I gave 2001. In fact, I'm going to grade 2001 a 7, not a 7.5. Um, as much as I like the first film, like, you can just... Oh, yeah. One thing to know. You don't even have to watch the first film. In the beginning, there's an entire prologue that gives, like... That tells everything what happened. The finding of the monolith, the monolith beam towards Jupiter, Hal's malfunction, and, you know, lots of other stuff. They even include that famous line from the book, Bowman says, My God, it's full of stars. So yeah, that's the review.
8 out of 10. Post your thoughts. I think it's underrated. See ya.